Hello. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue our discussion here for chapter 12. Now I'm going to go ahead and, as we've been doing, go through the slides for chapter 12 with you and then go through the practice midterm for chapter 12 as well. So let me go ahead and put my machine in slideshow mode. And as you can see, we're going to be talking about financial statement fraud schemes. Now, when we talk about financial fraud schemes, we're not talking about stealing necessarily. We're not talking about the larceny discussion that we've had. And some of the things that will be coming up later in the course, we'll talk about actual stealing, like larceny. Here, we're talking about lying providing information to financial statements that is false, misleading, unsupportive, and what an entity would be doing in a fraud scheme such as this is trying to make the company look like a more attractive investment, either in the current period or perhaps they're looking to future periods to see if they can show some sort of growth trends in the company and whatnot that will then lead investors and creditors to want to go ahead and uh, provide capital to the entity. And then of course, there could be harm done to those individuals uh, as a result if the financial performance was overstated, financial performance trends were overstated, um, investors and creditors could make a poor investment decision of later on those chickens come home to roost essentially. So what we're going to look at here as we go through and I get my uh, slide clicker to work, is we are really looking at deliberate misstatement. Remember, what defines fraud is intent. So there's deliberate misstatement, omissions in the financial statements, disclosure requirements that aren't being followed, that are being exaggerated, and ultimately it deceives and it could potentially harm. And remember, we talked about the accounting standards last time. And when we look at accounting standards, we are focusing, of course, on investors and creditors. That's the main individuals that the Financial Accounting Standard Board looks at. And so we have these investors and creditors that could be harmed. Now, we're going to talk more about the uh, auditing standards, the uh, auditing standards associated with fraud. We'll get into that more, but uh, that would be the responsibility of the auditor to detect misstatements, whether caused by error, which is unintentional, or fraud, which we've defined as being intentional. But the ultimate responsibility is to management to prevent, detect, uh, deter fraud in the entity. So we'll talk a little bit um, about um, the opportunity aspect of the fraud triangle. We'll talk about controls, and then we're going to really start to get into that as we move forward into our next chapters. So taking a look, financial statement fraud, okay, could be the falsification, manipulation of material financial records, okay, these financial statements themselves, but it could also be the supporting documentation, uh, again, auditors are going to want to come and look at that. And so the entity will have the concealment objective of fraud, of course. And uh, so they could falsify the um, supporting documents. Intentional, okay? And again, intentional is a big part of this, right? Doing it on purpose. Intentional uh, omission or representation of various events, transactions, accounts. Deliberate misapplication of accounting principles, policies, procedures. So we're going to see that the entity is trying to push the accounting standards to such a level where ultimately they intentionally cause the financial statements to be uh, materially misstated. And then, of course, in turn, uh, intentional. And of course, the key word being here, deliberate, intentional, right? The intent to act aspect of it. Um, omission of particular disclosures. Maybe they don't want to show that there are related party transactions, for example, and so they don't disclose those properly the way uh, general accepted accounting principles had advised us that we're supposed to. Now you come and you take a look at the costs associated with financial statement fraud, and they tell us legal cost, increased insurance costs, loss of productivity, adverse impacts on employee morale, customers you know, harming the goodwill of the entity because they know that management is somehow involved in uh, fraud, you know, suppliers, okay, negative stock uh, market reactions. Now they say 
that these costs are impossible to measure. I'm not sure that I agree with impossible. I think that some of these are difficult. Um, you know, when we look, um, certainly legal costs would be quantifiable, increased insurance costs would be quantifiable, but some of these others, the loss of productivity, loss of trust, employee morale, yeah, these do get difficult, uh, if not impossible, some of these other ones to measure. So you can measure some of these costs. Uh, it would be interesting to see a uh, study that might be done to see what the legal fees are associated with, you know, fraud, suits, and that sort of thing. Uh, taking a look, um, other cost undermining the reliability, quality uh, of the financial reporting process, uh, jeopardizes the integrity of the company, the entity itself, but also the profession, the accounting profession, the auditing profession, right? Uh, some of the scandals, Enron and some of those things not only affected the confidence that individuals have in the financial reports, but also the audit process as well. Uh, that can then lead to a broader uh, distrust of capital markets, market participants, and all of this is important in terms of making the markets efficient and helps with the growth of the economy. So auditors play an important role and there has to be you know, the trust of auditors as we go through this process. So we need to keep that in mind as well. So when we start to now dig into different types of fraud schemes, we're going to be talking about fictitious revenues. Entities will want to probably overstate revenues, although they could understate revenue in the current period because they are satisfied with whatever their revenues are and their income is this period. And they want to try to throw some things into the next period. But it's usually an overstatement issue that we're looking at. Timing differences, not properly matching the revenue and expenses. Improper asset valuation. Um, one thing that we saw around the time when Sarbanes-Oxley was uh, being uh, being issued, we saw that um, it was in that case, it was WorldCom was capitalizing things that should have been being expensed, thus increasing the value of the assets, increasing the value of the inventory, all of these things would be improper asset valuation. Uh, concealing liabilities and expenses. We say concealing that we don't want to show liabilities, we don't want to show the related expense, less liability, higher value of the entity, right? Uh, less expense, higher income, higher value to the entity as we start to overstate our stockholders' equity. And then improper disclosures, related party transactions are probably the one that was most uh, prevalent when they were talking about Enron and that they were having transactions with related parties and they weren't disclosing that these entities were uh, connected to them and treating them as though they were separate entities. Taking a look now at revenue. So recording goods or services that did not occur. When we look at revenue, we are interested in something called the occurrence assertion. Did the revenue actually occur? Okay. Um, so we could overstate the price that we are providing our service for or selling our, our product for. We could pretend like we're selling things to customers when in fact these customers don't exist. Uh, we could be trying to uh, overstate our sales to legitimate customers. We'll talk about something called channel stuffing where you uh, create terms that cause your uh, customers to buy too much product at a point in time and you make it sound, well, you can return it at any point in time. And it starts to go outside of the definition of a sale at some point, yet the company still wants to report it as a sale. Um, we talk about the fraud triangle a little bit before, and we're going to continue that discussion uh, today, but we talk about uh, incentive and pressure as one of the things that causes an entity to engage in financial reporting fraud. The incentive being, hey, you'll get a better bonus if you show a higher revenue, higher net income. Pressure being what, hey, if you don't show those good performances, you are going to be, you know, fired or receive a, some sort of reprimand from the company, right? Now, coming down, what would be some red flags? What would be some things that would cause us to say, hmm, we think maybe we have an issue here with improper revenue recognition. 
And as we go through these red flags for the different fraud schemes that we just outlined a minute ago, finance reporting fraud schemes that we just outlined for a minute ago, we're going to see some repeat in the red flags. So trends uh, are going to be an important part of the sort of analytical procedure that someone would do to see if there is some concern about fraud. And we'll see that we're going to do something called uh, horizontal analysis, which is a longitudinal approach to see how things are changing over time, but also something called vertical analysis or common size analysis, where we're looking to see if certain financial statement items uh, make sense uh, it, it, when in comparison to maybe the industry or in comparison to a particular base, say uh, the percent that are um, that our sales are making up of, say, a particular uh, item, say our total assets, those sort of things. So we start to take a look. And uh, if you have rapid growth, unusual profitability compared to other companies in the industry. So what's happening? Other companies are showing, you know, maybe losses. Well, you know, our entity that we're looking at is showing a growth when the entities in the same industry are showing a decline. Uh, recurring negative cash flow from operations. Now, let's think about cash flow from operations for a second. When you look at the statement of cash flows, you have your operating, investing, and financing section. And what happens is we will show a net income and then we'll reconcile the cash provided by operations. Well, if you're seeing growth in income, but not a lot of cash is being generated, from those operations, well, it starts to raise the question, well, what's happening? Are they having trouble collecting the receivables? Maybe, could be, or maybe they have put what, some fictitious sales in, and as a result, um, they're not gonna collect on those, obviously. So the cash uh, flow isn't matching what we're seeing as the uh, income, okay? So showing that income, yeah but not generating cash flow from operation could be a red flag. Uh, significant transactions with related parties. So again, uh, we're looking at these related parties and saying, well, you know, are they really uh, arm's length transaction or are they actually controlling the entity? And of course, we'll talk about the disclosures around that. Um, they talk about um, these entities um, not being audited. Um, you would want to see that a related entity is being audited, particularly if we're gonna be doing some consolidation. Um, when they say audited by another firm here, and again, guys, I kind of go with what um, the textbook is providing us sometimes, just because I think it's worth the discussion, um, you know, audited by another firm, that really shouldn't be that much of a problem because the other firm, uh, if we were going to rely on their information, we would be doing some work to see that they are independent, to see that they are competent, to see if we can accept their work as part of parcel of our audit of, say, the um, consolidated entity, you know, if we were the auditors of what they call the group financial statements component auditors, which are those individuals that are auditing subsidiaries and whatnot, we would have some responsibility to make sure um, that we are satisfied that those uh, component auditors, those other auditors are doing certain work. And we may even want to review uh, some of the work that they've done to be satisfied that uh, they follow the procedure. So there are ways around the um, audited by another firm, but you would want to see uh, that they are audited. So if they were not audited, yeah, that would be more of a concern to me. Taking a look um, at some more flags, uh, unusual or highly complex transactions. Now, uh, I'm assuming that you may be a little earlier on in your career here with this comment. And uh, what I tell my students is if you don't understand something, do not let the company make you feel like, well, you should know that or you know, kind of uh, give you a feeling of in insufficiency of inadequacy um, in your knowledge. But meanwhile, they're intentionally making things complex so that you'll give up and, and not understand what's going on. So you always need to understand what is the nature of the transaction, what's behind it, what would be some good support for whatever it is that you're seeing. 
Uh, unusual growth in the number of days of sales uh, in receivable. Now we're going to talk more about that. And I'm literally going to show you some calculations when we get to our practice midterm. We're actually going to practice this a little bit uh, with some numbers. But um, if we're showing that the accounts receivable is staying uncollected for long periods of time, I would think you know, even though we talk about industry averages and whatnot, it does vary by industry, but I would think the receivables that are getting past 30, 60 days old, uh, you have to start to question, is this a real sale? Is there really somebody out there that is going to pay on this thing? Have they offered such credit terms that are such that it's a long-term deal and the individual may never pay and they may be able to return the product after such a long period of time? that's the case, then we can't take the revenue. That's going to be more of a liability. It's almost like an unearned revenue at that point in time. And so um, we'll see how we could use those calculations. But if you start to see those days and receivable pile up, that would be an example of a red flag. Um, unusually large surge in sales, okay, could also be. So that gets more into that uh, longitudinal analysis, that horizontal analysis. Uh, timing differences. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to record our revenue and expenses in the improper period. And we do this to maybe overstate revenue in the current period. So the sale didn't happen, you know, just to use an example. Uh, we're auditing the 2023 financial statements, but the sale really shouldn't have been recorded until 2024, but the entity is trying to take some sales. Maybe they're shipping the goods free on board uh, destination, but they're going ahead and taking the sale now. Meanwhile, that won't be sale until the goods actually arrive. So they're trying to take some sales. Well, well you know, we're going to sell those things, but let's take the, um, you know, it's going to eventually hit at the books as a sale. And remember, we talk about a rationalization, but it's not a big harm if we take that this year instead of next year. That stupid accounting rule. Uh, who cares? You know, uh, so they're trying to throw more revenue in the current period or maybe they have enough revenue this period and then they're going to do what they're going to try to uh, hold off taking that revenue this period and start to record it improperly in the next period to get a head start on the next year same thing with expenses over understating expenses in uh, whatever particular year uh, one of the ones that i have seen uh, companies play around with is the allowance for bad debts, bad debt expense. And sometimes if a company is seeing a particularly good year, they'll say, well, we think we should put more in the allowance for doubtful accounts, which is going to bring down the assets of the entity as you subtract the allowance for doubtful accounts from the account receivable, higher bad, bad debt expense, that's going to cause my net income, my retained earnings will be smaller. And what they're planning and they're looking into the you know business crystal ball and saying, well, wow, you know, things aren't going to be as good in the upcoming years, but what we'll do is we'll put more in the allowance now. So then when we analyze our allowance in the future, we don't have to put as much in and we can smooth profits that way. So throwing expenses into the uh, wrong period um, would be examples of timing differences. Uh, when we look matching revenues and expenses accordingly, right? The revenue, uh, if an expense has been incurred in a generation of revenue, then it should be reported in the same period as the revenue. Uh, premature revenue recognition before we've met all the tenets of what is considered revenue, we go ahead and we start to take that revenue even though we hadn't completely earned it. So we should be reporting that as an unearned revenue and we try to push it into revenue uh, early. Long-term contracts, I mean, sometimes long-term contracts are fine, but if the contract is longer and we have you know, uh, performance obligations that are to be performed over time, then we need to look at that and make sure that we're recording that revenue uh, in the proper periods as it is earned. Channel stuffing, I mentioned already, getting customers to buy more product that they can use in a reasonable period of time because we're trying to boost sales in the current period. Well, that's going to affect future sales as customers build up some of our product and then they don't have to buy as much later. 
or we make the terms so generous that the person says, okay, well, I'm not gonna have to pay for you know three years on this thing. You send me this stuff, then you know, I'll hang on to it. It's not affecting my cash balance, and I'm getting to use the product, and I don't have to pay for such a long period of time. Uh, that would uh, not rec meet the criteria to be recognized as a revenue uh, because that was defined as channel stuffing and again, recording expenses uh, in the wrong period. So red flags. And as I mentioned, you're you know, seeing some repeat on these because these are things that start to happen as entities engage in whatever fraudulent financial reporting scheme. So now unusual profitability, um, negative cash flow or inability to generate cash flow from operations. Meanwhile, we're seeing a nice net income growth, complex transactions, unusual increase in gross margin uh, or a gross uh, profit versus industry peers. Remember our gross profit, gross margin is our net sales minus our cost of goods sold. Well, if we're seeing a nice, you know, increase in uh, net uh, gross profit, uh, net profit, and um, other entities aren't showing as much of a growth, or maybe they're showing a decline. Um, you know, if there's inflation, then the cost of things are going up. Meanwhile, we're showing an increase in gross profit. Is our revenue? Remember, we'll do a common size test. So, is our gross profit staying consistent with growths in revenue, et cetera? Okay. All of these would be red flags, unusual uh, growth in the number of days, sales and receivable. I mentioned unusual decline in the number of days purchases in accounts payable. So, what's happening? The company is uh, again showing what showing lower accounts payable, even though they're having what they're having these uh, significant costs. And so, as they do that, then the turnover of that accounts payable is going to start to um, speed up and increase. And then you're going to see that the payables are sitting there in the uh, accounts payable over a uh, a longer uh, period of time. So uh, it's, are they recording all of the accounts payable that they should? Um, and that would be an indication that maybe they're trying to uh, hide some uh, information from us, trying to decrease the liabilities, hide those expenses and liabilities from us. Um, so getting to that liability uh, expense omission, concealing the liabilities, right? Debit the expense, credit the account payable, trying to bring those and conceal those. Uh, capitalizing expenses. Again, that was something that WorldCom was doing. We're taking something that should be reported as an expense on the income statement, reducing our net income. And instead, we go ahead and put that on the balance sheet, show it as an asset. And, um, you know, basically we'll be sitting there and making our, our uh, net income look better today. Now, if we're capitalizing depreciable assets, of course, that means that what will be taking depreciation in future periods. So our, the, so our net income will come down in future periods, but maybe we think that, you know, in the future periods will be okay and it won't matter that we're um, overstating our expenses in future periods. Uh, failure to not only disclose, we have to literally have to book liabilities for, there's a journal entry, you debit warranty expense, you credit the liability. It's an estimate. And so this also makes us vulnerable here as the company starts to estimate what their future um, exposure will be for warranty costs. You have to match that, getting back to the matching principle with the sale that happened in this period. So you're required to look forward and say, well, what is my liability gonna be for warranty? You take an expense on that in the period of sale, report the liability, and then later, as you have to start making good on those warranty costs, then you can go ahead and reduce that liability. If you have to say provide a replacement product, then you can debit the liability and credit inventory for whatever it is you're having to replace at that point in time. But you have to record the liability, right, at the time of the sale for the proper matching. Okay, again, um, you know, we're having a little bit of deja vu here. 
on some of these um, indicators, I think you're starting to understand that what cash flow, the statement of cash flow is important, right? And that it can be indicative of a potential problem if the cash flows aren't matching what we're seeing on the income statement um, in terms of the uh, profitability, right? And the earnings growth. Um, assets and liabilities based on significant estimates, okay? Again, uh, that warranty expense, the bad debt expense that I mentioned before the accounts receivable and the allowance for doubtful accounts, you know, nobody really knows whether or not we're going to be collect on those, be able to collect on those receivables, but we need to make a reasonable estimate, a supportable estimate of what we think the amount is going to be, usually based on history, and we need to properly record that. So we would want to see, are there some bias in that uh, estimate process? Um, and so you may see non-financial management having taking a keen interest in that. Um, I was on an assignment um, working for the federal government. Um, we were looking at banks and we were looking to see how good of a job they were doing for that allowance for loan loss, which is a big provision that comes up on the uh, income statement. And we did start to detect a little bit of a senior management interest in that number that seemed a little more than it should be and that it should really be based on uh, data. Uh, instead, they were sort of coming in with, well, we have these bigger policies and whatnot, they're influencing this. And it was uh, looked to us like maybe they were trying to, um, trying to smooth the profits over time. And so those are the kinds of things that you would look at, particularly when it comes to, again, uh, significant estimates like bad debt expense, like our liability warranty, our, our, um, our warranty liability and expense. Um, concealed liabilities, um, allowance for sales returns, warranty claims, okay? And, and you see those things going down. Meanwhile, our industry peers are maybe experiencing an uptick in those areas. Um, again, unusual reduction in the number of days purchases and accounts payable. Again, if you sit there and you start to bring down that account payable number, that's going to cause your turnover to go up. That's going to cause the uh, days and receivable to come down or the days and payable in this case to come down. And that could be an indication that they're maybe concealing uh, some of those accounts payable. Okay. Uh, reducing accounts payable when competitors are maybe stretching out payments uh, terms to vendors. And so um, and we really didn't mention this um, earlier, but we've said this, we've had this compared to um, you know, competitors and whatnot. Um, so industry standard is an important, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. We're gonna make some calculations and say, oh, well, it's not meeting industry standard. What does that mean? Okay, improper disclosure. Uh, again, omission of liabilities. Uh, subsequent events. Subsequent events are things, and there are two types that are recognized and uh, derecognized subsequent events. If the conditions exist at the balance sheet date, we literally have to take a loss and a contingent liability for whatever that subsequent event is. So we have a lawsuit that was pending at the end of the year, say December 31st, but the lawsuit doesn't get settled until the next year, but before we issue the financial statements. Well, we would be required to go ahead and literally debit a loss and credit a liability for that lawsuit that got settled, say, in January before we issued the financial statements because the lawsuit existed at December 31st. That would be a recognized subsequent event. An unrecognized subsequent event has to be disclosed. Okay, so let's say we have some sort of uh, fire that destroys one of our plants or something, okay? But the fire doesn't occur until after the balance sheet date, but before we issue the financial statement. So let's say the fire occurs December, uh, not December, December 31st year end. The fire occurs in January 15th, just to make up a date, okay? What happens? We wouldn't have to show the loss from the fire, we wouldn't have to make a journal entry, but we would have to disclose in our footnotes that we had this major subsequent event. So if it's not uh, recognized, if it's derecognized, it still is disclosed. Uh, management fraud. 
you know, this is a little bit uh, to me, oh, you know, catch 22. Well, I'm trying to find the fraud. Um, if I, you know, if they've disclosed it, then I think I know about the fraud. But if there was fraud, it should certainly uh, be disclosed in the uh, footnotes so that people know, oh, we've got some problems here with this company. Uh, related party transactions. There is nothing wrong with related party transactions. Okay, now again, if you have an entity that's under common control, uh, then, you know, um, then those transactions would have to be eliminated when we would consolidate. But let's say we have an entity that we don't necessarily control, but we're making loans to this uh, entity, okay? Um, we, uh, are making loans to our officers, okay? Or maybe our officers are making loans to us, whatever. There's nothing wrong with those things, but but they need to be bright lines of disclosure around that in the footnotes showing that these transactions were with related parties. So that's an important thing. Accounting changes. Uh, it's not, you know, when you look at some of these things, you know, are they properly disclosing things? There's nothing wrong with related party transactions as long as they are accounted for properly and properly disclosed. And we're really talking about the disclosure aspect here. Uh, accounting changes. You can change your accounting policy, but if you do, as I mentioned a little bit last time, you have to put bright lines of disclosure around that. You're going to have to calculate the cumulative effect of the change in the accounting principle. You have to restate any prior period statements that are being presented. Uh, and then you would be providing in the footnotes quite a bit of information about what the change has been and how many years you think it'll affect and those sort of things. So again, uh, some of these things, of course, liability omission is not right. Management fraud is not right. But having subsequent event related party transactions, accounting changes are not a violation of the accounting rules unless they are not properly disclosed along the lines of what we're talking about here. Some red flags, um, single person dominating things, okay? Talking about that management fraud, okay? Um, you know, uh, rationalization, attitude, the person, I'm the owner, I started this company, I'm going to decide what goes into financial statements. No, the accounting standards decide what's going to go into the uh, financial statements. So we would need some sort of what? Compensating controls. That's why we have boards of directors. That's why we have internal auditors. Of course, external auditors are ultimately there at the with the net at the bottom trying to catch all this stuff. But uh, there should be the proper internal controls. Uh, if you don't have a good board of directors, you don't have a good audit committee, which is a part of the board of directors, then they're not providing the proper oversight. You're going to start to see all of these problems come up with uh, overriding the controls, et cetera. Uh, ineffective communication in terms of ethical standards. There should be code of conduct, should be properly communicated to all the employees. And then again, this idea of rapid unusual growth. And again, we talk about the comparison to industry standards. Uh, <clears throat> again, um, taking a look at some of the red flags for disclosures, uh, significant, unusual, highly complex transactions. Okay, again, um, you need to understand if there's a complex area, leases are very complex, right? Well, you know, you're gonna have to work through that and make sure you understand that they have followed the appropriate requirements of the leases, which include a lot of disclosure requirements. Related party transactions need to be properly um, uh, disclosed and accounted for and disclosed. Um, significant bank accounts um, with subsidiaries. Maybe they're trying to have a tax haven by having some offshore accounts um, and then uh, overly complex organizational structures. So they're trying to hide from you that they're having a related party. You think, oh, okay, geez, they're not related. Meanwhile, they've made the structure so complex that you can't even follow the labyrinth of, of how the company is put together. So these kinds of things would be red flags. Um, known history of violation of securities laws, uh, recurring attempts to justify uh, marginal or inappropriate accounting, uh, formal or informal restrictions on the auditor um, 
you know, uh, the standards are very clear as to what the auditor's responsibility is. And if management starts putting restrictions on what the auditor is able to do, uh, we call that a scope limitation. And if there's a scope limitation, your options are to uh, qualify your opinion based on that scope limitation. You could disclaim an opinion, say, I don't even have an opinion on the financial statements. And then if those limitations start to get beyond uh, the pale, then uh, you would withdraw from that engagement. Improper asset valuation, inventory. Think about it. If I overstate the value of my inventory, what's going to happen? Let's say I overstate the, val the value of my ending inventory. Well, remember, we have what? We have beginning inventory. And then we add purchases to that. Okay, that gives us our goods available for sale. Gaps, okay, goods available for sale. And then we subtract the ending inventory. Okay, and that gives us our what? Our cost of goods sold. Well, if we were to figure out a way to say undervalue our, our ending inventory, let's start with that. That would do what? That would drive the ending inventory down. That would do what? <clears throat> um, that would then make this cost of goods sold, right? We'd have a smaller subtract. That would make the cost of goods sold um, a little bit bigger for us. And so now we're showing what? We're showing a smaller gross profit, but maybe we're doing that because we're satisfied with this year. And now what's going to happen? Now, our, as we go into our next year, our beginning inventory is down. That's going to bring our goods available for sale down. We subtract the ending inventory. And now our cost of goods sale, cost of goods sold is down. And so we're throwing profits into future years because maybe we're satisfied with this year. Or you could go the other way with that. We could sit here and say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my ending inventory um, to be... Uh, higher. And when the ending inventory is higher, then I have what? Then I have a bigger subtract from my cost of goods sold. That brings what? That brings my cost of goods sold down. And if my cost of goods sold comes down, maybe I'm trying to show a better income this year because I'm thinking next year I can start to do something with my sales or I see some trends where my sales are going to be going up, whatever. Okay. So inventory valuation, accounts receivable, valuation trying to make that accounts receivable look bigger so it looks like we have what more assets and more money coming in when in fact what our accounts receivable and our ability to collect that we're going to talk about the days and accounts receivable here uh is a good indication as to whether they might be um, having improper uh, accounts receivable that days and, and receivable status is going up could mean that they're having trouble collecting on the receivables which should also be a red flag that maybe those were fictitious sales or maybe their product isn't very good and you know they're just having trouble collecting on those because folks are you know arguing that they don't have to pay um, business combinations okay trying to um, overvalue a business that we have acquired. That's why we would want to see that there's audit of those component units to see that we're satisfied with some of the information that we're going to be consolidating into the group financial statements, fixed asset overvaluation. And again, the idea there uh, for fixed assets, because we do record them at historical cost, but maybe what we do is we uh, have a smaller depreciation that we're taking. We're saying that an asset has a longer life than it actually does. Or maybe we're sitting there and we're capitalizing things that should have been expensed. And we've mentioned that a couple of times. Again, the cash flow. Okay, we've seen that here a number of times. Um, significant decline in customer demand for our product. Uh, increasing business failure in the industry, uh, assets liabilities based on significant estimates. We've talked about that. Non-functional management's uh, obsession with the accounting policies. Uh, and again, uh, looking at industry period in terms of our uh, gross profit or gross margin. Okay. 
Uh, again, I've mentioned unusual growth in the number of days receivable. Why aren't you collecting on those receivables? Are they real receivables? Is there somebody out there? Why is it taking you 120 days to collect on receivable? Maybe those were fictitious sales, right? Uh, allowance uh, for bad debts. Again, um, maybe not taking as much allowance based on the aging how long those receivables have been in status, um, but maybe trying to take a little more this year so next year looks better. Um, uh, obsolete inventory. We need to look at the inventory. We need to evaluate it for obsolescence. If the inventory is obsolete or damaged, we have a requirement that we have to write that down to the lower cost or net realizable value. If an entity is using uh, last in first out, the LIFO inventory method, then it's the lower of, um, um, cost or market. But if there's been a drop in the market and that market now is below our original cost of that inventory, we do need to write that down to a lower amount. Um, unusual relationship between fixed assets and depreciation. Maybe they've tried to slow down the depreciation on their assets by changing the estimated life of an asset, okay? And then um, adding assets while competitors are reducing capital tied up. Are you really acquiring assets now? This is where the industry is going. Maybe they've underdepreciated or maybe they, again, they've recorded some things as assets that were actually expenses. Okay, so we've got some ideas of the different fraud schemes, the different um, um, indications, flat red flags that could be consistent with those. We talked about this a little bit last time. I think I showed you a screenshot of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants standard that auditors are to follow as it relates to fraud. Um, I think that it should be AU240, uh, and they should have C here, which is the clarified standards. But this is pretty good information for us here, the way they presented it, which is the consideration of fraud in a financial statement auditor and remember uh, audit. And remember, we said that the auditor has the responsibility to detect material misstatement in the financial statements, whether caused by error or fraud. So they call out the fraud there. And it says, look, auditors, you have to consider the potential that there is fraud. And we're going to see that that consideration goes on throughout the audit. So even though AU240 exists in the way the um, codification, uh, the auditing standards put together, they have different steps. They have preliminary steps and they get down to planning steps and the fraud standard is codified in the uh, planning section of the auditing standards, okay? But that doesn't mean that you plan accordingly and then you stop thinking about the potential fraud. It goes on throughout um, the audit, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look and we can have misappropriation of assets, that's larceny, or you can have what financial reporting fraud, which is what we're really talking about here, which is lying, right? You have stealing, you have lying. We called um, stealing larceny. We used that word before. So um, we need to remind our staff, professional skepticism. Professional skepticism, I think sometimes my students think that you're walking around, you know, distrusting everybody and people, you know, getting comfortable being auditors because that's not necessarily their nature. That's not what we're doing with professional skepticism. Professional skepticism says, hmm, there is a potential here that I'm not being told the truth. And is there something that doesn't sound right to me? Is there something that doesn't ring true to me? And if it does not ring true to you, doesn't ring true to you, then you're going to need to investigate further. Okay. It doesn't tell you that you know, you know, go and start calling the police and say, hey, we got you know fraud here. You're going to do what? You're going to investigate further to see if there are further. And we talked about some of the red flags and whatnot. Now, what you would need to do is you would need to bring your staff together. And when I say you need to bring your staff together, it's a partner level type of discussion. Okay. The partner leads the discussion and there's a brainstorming. A good time to have the brainstorming is after you've done a tour of the facility and you sit there and you say, did you see anything that might have given you some concern as we walked around and looked at the facility? I was on an assignment where we were looking 
at the Federal Reserve Banks and the, uh, not the Federal Reserve Banks, but the um, regional finance centers for the federal government. So what these regional finance centers do is they print off federal checks, at least in those days, you know, they would print federal checks off for different things, tax refunds, social security payments, et cetera. Now we're done much more online, but in those days you'd have checks just being turned out. Well, after we took the tour of the facility, we come back to our office and we say, you know, the partner leads a discussion. Well, it's not a partner, it's a director in the government, but director leads a discussion. Do you see any way that they could get a check out of that place? And through observations, we saw that there were some concerns about the way they were treating checks stock because they were on these huge spools of 40,000 checks on a spool you know, it was seen more as this heavy thing that, you know, needed to be moved around. It was like a piece of equipment as opposed to seeing it as live check stock that really needed to be locked away uh, each evening and whatnot. So that's the kind of uh, control issue you might identify through that brainstorming. Or you might, again, keeping that broad triangle, you might see something that indicates incentive and pressure. You might see the not locking the check stock opportunity or you might sense, uh, is there um, a rationalization, a bad attitude amongst uh, different folks as we talk to them and whatnot. So all of that, and that would kind of come under the auspice of internal, external pressures that you would be observing. So you need to do that. Again, this is in the early phases, it's in the planning phase. You continue on, make inquiries of management. Have there been instances of fraud? Have there been allegations of fraud? You know, the way you maybe ask that is, can you please tell us about fraud that has occurred? So the tone of that question sounds as though you already knew about it, right? Even though you may not even know that something uh, existed. Um, unusual relationships. Again, some of those things we're going to be talking about, and I've indicated a little bit, the horizontal analysis. Why are things trending up? when the industry averages are trending down. Um, what are the fraud risk factors? And um, we've talked about those incentive and pressure. Are they there? Opportunity, okay? Uh, do we have um, the rationalization, the attitude, and then uh, see if there's other information that might indicate um, material misstatement due to fraud. Now, once you have identified one of the fraud risk factors, okay? You want to ask yourself, well, what risk is it going to lead to, okay? What is the type of risk? So I've seen, um, you know, I've seen uh, opportunity. I've seen the situation where I think there's poor controls, okay? So what type of risk will that indicate? I'm seeing that someone can steal computers, well, that's going to lead to uh, that's going to lead to the potential of misappropriation of assets, right? What is the significance of the risk? Well, are they talking about um, you know stealing office supplies? Okay, you don't probably need to worry so much about the fact that someone can pilfer pens out of the place, okay? But if they're talking about significant fixed assets, or cash. It could be being uh, stolen there, then that would be significant. What is the likelihood? Look, if somebody has to, you know, jump out of a 10th story window with a piece of equipment strapped to their back in order to get the thing out of there, then that diminishes the likelihood of the risk. And then what is the pervasiveness of the risk? Is it going to affect just a small account on the balance sheet, something on the income statement, miscellaneous expenses on the income statement, or is it gonna be affecting a significant line item like revenue is gonna affect the overall value of the companies reported on the balance sheet, et cetera, okay? So then you would take a look, well, are there controls that are prevent or detect these? Um, let's talk a little bit about um, when we look and we assess the controls and whatnot, you have inherent risk, you have control risk, you have detection risk, and that is going to be relevant to your audit risk. And of course, audit risk holds in there the fact that the financial statements may be materially misstated because of fraud, right? So when you start to look at incentive and pressure, just going back to our fraud 
triangle, incentive, okay? Then you have what? You have opportunity. And you have rationalization. I'll just call that rat. Okay, you have rationalization. And when we look, what? The control risk. Okay, now the auditor controls the detection risk. So the auditor needs to see how these two things really are affecting the different fraud risk factors. Um, and detection risk is the risk that the auditor's procedure won't identify the misstatement, okay? But when we talk about inherent risk, control risk, those are things that exist in the company. So when we look at inherent risk, okay, maybe incentive is causing the inherent risk to go up, rationalization is causing the inherent risk to go up. You know, um, we have what, we have a situation where, uh, if I don't uh, get a big net income, um, I'm gonna, you know, lose my job or whatever. If I get a big net income, I'll get a nice bonus, right? And so what do we do? We start to make the transactions very complex so that it makes it more difficult to detect what we're doing in terms of how we're, uh, you know, how we're, uh, how we're accounting for those transactions, right? Or maybe I'm sitting there and saying, oh, I'm a dominating management. Forget about these accounting standards. You know, the accounting standards are so annoying. And I've heard companies sit there and talk to uh, talk that way. Oh, you know, FASB needs to be shut down because they ain't telling us that there were too many stuff that we have to do. And I've heard you know, individuals talk that way. And it's like, well, you know, that's not how it worked. We have a seven member board that is sanctioned by the Security Exchange Commission, like we talked about last time, to figure this stuff out. And you need to live within those rules, right? Okay. And then uh, control risk is really, you know, the opportunity. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that can lead to misappropriation of assets, to fraudulent financial reporting. Now, when you look at this, you could say, well, wait a minute, if I have a dominating management, that that could affect the internal control too. So now we've got what? We've got rationalization also potentially uh, being affected by the control risk as well, right? And remember we said last time it is more of an art, it's not a science. I don't know if we said this last time, but I've said this in the past, it's more of an art than a science as you try to figure how the different fraud risk factors are uh, being driven by your assessments. Now, once you've done your assessment and you've done your assessment of the risk of material misstatement, risk of material misstatement, okay, is your internal risk and your control risk. If that's going up, the auditor needs to bring down that detection risk to um, keep the audit risk uh, down. So we'll talk more about that, but I'm just trying to give you a sense is when they say assessing the identified risk, uh, taking into account the controls and whatnot, and then depending on how your inherent risk and control risk are going up, the auditor will need to respond to that um, by uh, lowering the detection risk um, and, uh, and then thus increasing our opportunity to detect a material statement caused by, in this case, fraud. Of course, we're looking for errors as well. So the auditor needs to respond. Okay? The auditor will respond in overall level. What kind of uh, staff and I'm going to assign to this? If you're seeing the fraud risk factors existing, the risk of material misstatement due to fraud is going up, then you're going to probably assign more senior staff. You're probably going to provide more supervision. You're going to visit the audit site more, that sort of thing. Um, timing extent of and nature of my audit procedures. I'm probably going to do more testing extent. I'm going to want to take larger sample sizes because I'm worried that there might be some fraud in there and I want to make sure I'm lowering that detection risk. Nature, I'm probably going to want some more external evidence than internal evidence to drive down that detection risk. Timing, I'm probably going to do more testing at year end versus at interim. Okay. Uh, respond to management risk, uh, management override and control. Um, the standards specifically require that the auditor document why they don't think there's a risk of management override of controls and why they don't think there's improper revenue recognition, because those tend to be the big problems in the history. The studies of fraud cases over the years indicate that that's often the combination 
management override the controls and the desire to increase revenue to increase that that income. So we will have to document why we don't think those problems exist in our work papers, looking for unusual adjustments, transactions occurring towards the end of the year, unreasonable estimates that tend to exhibit a bias, uh, unusual transactions. What is the reason for those? What is the rationale for those? As we go throughout the audit, as we do different audit tests, if we see something that makes us feel like, uh, yeah, you know, we had originally assessed the risk of material misstatement due to fraud at a lower level, but now we're seeing some things we actually do in the procedures that indicate to us that we might be a problem. What are we going to do? We're probably going to increase that assessment of the risk of material misstatement and alter the time and extent and nature of our substantive procedure accordingly. So... Again, even though you know it's in the planning section of the uh, codification uh, notice, they're reminding us as you go through the audit and do different procedures, you still need to consider, well, how do these procedures affect my assessment of the risk of material misstatement due to fraud? Communications, um, we are required to communicate one level of those involved. So if it is a clerk, then we're going to report that to the supervisor, supervisor to management. If a uh, misstatement occurred or fraud and it's material, then you're not going to just go one level above. That's going to senior management and those charged with governance. The audit committee of the board directors is a fancy way of saying those charged with governance. Um, you know, think about it. Somebody stole a million dollars, a clerk stole a million dollars. So you go and tell a supervisor who's making, you know, 80,000 a year, you say, hey, somebody stole $10 million. Let's bring that number up even more. Well, okay, you know, the supervisor might say, how'd you do it? Let's get out of here, right? So if it's calling a material misstatement, it must go to senior management. It must go to the board of directors, those charged with governance, probably the audit committee. If the fraud involves senior management, then that needs to go uh, to the board of directors. Um, there is potential. Notice that whole thing that I just described talked about the corporate governance structure. Uh, if there is fraud that uh, occurs and you are required in certain instances to report that externally, then you will. So usually we're saying, hey, let the corporate governance structure take care of this. But if it involves certain SEC violations, then you might need to report that to the SEC. If you were auditing an entity that was receiving federal financial assistance and you're doing something called a single audit, you are required to report anything that you find externally it needs to hit your, uh, your external report. Okay, and then of course, uh, everything needs to be documented and go through all the steps. We had the brainstorming, we made the assessment of risk material statement due to fraud. Here's how we responded at a general level, at an audit procedure level, et cetera. All that that we just talked about will need to be documented. Okay, good. Uh, let's look at some analysis then. Okay, and we talked a little bit. I'm going to start with horizontal analysis. Horizontal analysis here says that we're going to be analyzing between periods. It's often called a longitudinal analysis uh, in which we're going to look and see how have things changed year over year and does the trend make sense for us. Vertical analysis, and I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence by drawing the line here. Vertical analysis is often called a common size analysis. And basically, what we're looking is saying, well, look, does the amount of uh, cost of goods sold make sense versus the sale? And then you can combine these two, the sales versus um, you know, the, the, the sales percentage of the sales of the cost of goods sold, but then you can look at that over time to see how it's trending. So you can combine those. Ratio analysis is basically uh, some of these things that we're going to be talking about as we go through and see, well, you know, what is the turnover of the accounts receivable? Um, you know, uh, what are the days in accounts receivable status, et cetera? Okay, so you start to look at these and see I've kind of mentioned the tools again here on this slide, 
And you can do these intra-company, means within the company, industry uh, averages, what are the you know, overall industry, and then what is another company, intercompany um, <clears throat> relationships with maybe somebody that uh, you know, we know that there's a very similar individual company that we want to call out. Okay, so horizontal analysis, we're looking to see what has been the change over time. So let's just look at this example, okay? What you would do and the way you calculate these percentages, right, that they're saying here, is you would sit here and you would say, well, let's say I wanna get this 7.9%, how do we do that? Well, you'd look at the difference between those two, that's 75,000. And then you, you divide it by the first year in the analysis, okay? So in this example, it's 2008, so I would divide that 75,000 by the 945,000, okay? And that's gonna yield me that 7.9%, okay? Very, very, you know, quick, easy, fairly easy on Excel, whatever kind of an easy uh, calculation. And then, as I mentioned, you could go ahead and compare that to the industry, compare it to itself, you know, uh, why are they increasing their assets here in this example when everybody else's assets are coming down, et cetera. And then it starts to get you further down into some of those red flags, okay? Vertical analysis is going this way, also called aka okay, common size analysis. So when we look at this, now we're picking a base, say total assets, and then we just wanna see what percent a line item like current assets or cash, whatever, uh, would make up of that base, okay? And so they go through and they call that common size analysis. And again, you could then do a longitudinal or horizontal analysis along with that as well, trend analysis along with that as well. Okay, some ratio analysis. And since we mentioned receivable turnover a few times, let's go ahead and let's take a look at that. I'm just gonna go ahead and you know unfurl this for you. And we have what, for a receivable turnover, we put our net credit sales. Net credit sales are sales minus returns um, and minus um, uh, discounts, right? That's our net credit sales and it's credit sales. You then divide that by the average net receivable. Net receivable is your account receivable minus the allowance for doubtful accounts. Now they put the beginning and ending here and divided it by two. So in some cases, I see them using the average. In some cases, and we're gonna look at some of the homework questions here in a couple of minutes, uh, the practice midterm questions here in a couple of minutes, uh, you'll see that they just use the year-end balance. Okay, so you could use average, you could use year-end balance. I think it'd be, you know, I don't know, more technically interesting if you went ahead and used the industry average, but it's not a big, big deal, okay? And once you do that, you can see that this entity turned their accounts receivable over 46.4 times. In other words, they collected, it doesn't happen all at once, but on average, they collect all of their receivables and down to zero, right? 46.4 times in the course of the year. Now, it never actually gets down to zero, but that's what that number is telling you. They turned it over, they collected everything 46.4 times, and then they built up some more, collected everything, built up some more, and they did that 46.4 times. Again, it doesn't happen exactly as I'm saying, but on average, that's how many times they collected all of their receivables. Now, to see what are the number of days these things are sitting in receivable. Sometimes it's called the days of uncollectible receivable. You, of course, take the 365 day year, okay, and you divide it by the turnover, okay, and that tells us that they collected all of their receivable on average about 36 days. Okay, that's not too bad. That's pretty good, I think, for most entities, maybe 60 days, depending on the industry. You start getting into six, you know, past 60 days, 90 days. Now you start asking yourself, what's going on here? How come they're not collecting on these receivables as fast? Maybe there's some fictitious sales. That then leads you to further questioning and looking at the controls and the incentive and pressures and all of those different things to see, hey, maybe there's some fraud risk factors that are involved here.
Okay, so we've mentioned about the fraud triangle a number of times now, pressure, incentive, opportunity, and uh, rationalization, okay? And so what would happen if a company wanted to deter fraud, then they should reduce these things, right? Reduce the opportunity, why, how? Strengthen controls, reduce pressure. Don't put as much pressure to meet certain earnings targets or allow the, um, you know, the trends to go as they're going to go, right? Uh, instead of trying to take all the profit this year, understand that you've got a slow growth situation going on. Rationalization, um, make sure employees understand their responsibilities. Um, you know, understanding the responsibility, but... It, also, you know, the, the, the responsibility is reasonable, okay? Uh, I think that's important in that if people feel that you're putting unreasonable expectations on them, um, then that can also lead to the rationalization. Well, this is unrealistic anyway. So it's not just about telling the employees, well, this is what you're supposed to do, which I think some of the literature we're going to look at here tells you that, but also being reasonable in what you're expecting and out of individuals is an important part of reducing rationalization. Okay, so you can see some of these things, uh, tone at the top. Remember, we talked about the control environment last time, setting achievable goals. There you go. That will mitigate some of that rationalization. Um, okay, they're saying pressure here, but uh, yeah, you put the pressure, but also if the goal is unachievable, then that could start a rationalization, right? Uh, avoid excessive pressure, uh, change goals as market conditions warrant, et cetera. Discourage excessive internal expectations. Um, taking a look at opportunity, improve the controls. Maintain complete internal accounting records. No where your assets are, have identification plates that tell you where they're supposed to be. Periodically check those, um, you know, come around and scan those identification plates. Security system, uh, physically secure assets, cash, those sort of things. Personnel records, uh, background checks, um, you know, a background check you can get done through the, um, the, the FBI, Department of Justice, um, depending on the significance. Sometimes, uh, you know, things are so sensitive, they'll do a report to see if an individual was ever arrested. Um, and, you know, maybe the person was arrested, but they were found not guilty, but you still would want to hear, well, what would happen in that particular case? All of these kind of things would be reduced the opportunity. And then rationalization. And again, they talk about policies and proper training, and those are all true. But I think, you know, this starts to become a little bit more of an art here as you start to go, well, okay, but you could also mitigate some of the rationalization by not having unrealistic uh, expectations. Okay, so that is taking us through the discussion here, but let's go ahead and take some time now to look at the practice um, the practice midterm. So we're going to go ahead and see how, you know, potentially I could ask you some questions when you do your midterm on this stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and you can see on the screen that we have the um, practice midterm and see how um, we would uh, test the material uh, from this chapter here. And so let's take a look at this first one. We said, which of the following is not an example of financial statement fraud? And the key thing here that you can see that makes, you know, the obvious answer here, B, once you use the word unintentional, then it's not fraud. Fraud is defined as an intentional act, right? Whether it's misappropriation of assets or what we're talking about here in this chapter, which is fraudulent financial reporting. Okay, good. Let's take a look at number two while conducting the annual audit of Bluebird Company financial statements. L.C. Fin Finnegan, CFE, certified fraud examiner, right, CPA, came across some fishy findings. The company recorded several large and unusual sales at the end of the fiscal year to companies or customers that L.C., had never heard of, never heard of, you know, maybe she's audited these guys before. And, um, you know, 
uh, now all of a sudden they got a bunch of new customers. What's going on, right? Further, all these sales occurred within the company's specialty division, which has previously been in danger of closing. Uh oh, there's the pressure. Based on these findings, what type of financial statement fraud? And this is uh, pointing to what uh, to fictitious revenues. Okay. All right, good. Number three, Sharp Medical Supply Inc. has suffered recent slowdown in sales and is in danger of showing a loss for 20X1. Here comes the pressure. To boost income, the sales manager encourages two of the company's largest customers to overbuy several slow-moving products at deep discounts. He also offered them extended payment terms, some of which delay payment until the end of 20X2. This is channel stuffing, encouraging them to buy things, putting what, you know, terms that are such that have you actually earned that revenue in this current year. If it's over two years, if they can return that, that's probably not meeting the definition of a sale. So we've got some channel stuffing going on. Number four, capitalizing revenue based expenses as depreciable assets. So it should have hit the income statement instead of just putting it on the balance sheet will cause the income in the current year to be what? Understated because we're reducing our expenses. Future years will have our expenses being what? Being overstated. Um, and so um, our expenses are overstated. Therefore, our income will be understated. Make sure we understand what we're looking for your income, right? It's going to be overstated in the current period. And then in future periods, as our depreciation expense goes up, our income will be understated. But maybe the company's satisfied with that because they're saying, well, we're going to see you know, some better trends in revenue in later years. So we don't mind taking those expenses in later years uh, as we move forward. Number five, an inability to generate cash flow from operations. Remember, we've talked about that quite a bit. While well, reporting earnings growth is a red flag for what? Improper asset valuation. Yeah, what's happening? I'm sitting there and I'm taking the um, inventory and I'm reporting it at improper amounts. Thus, I'm showing a higher net income and yet I'm not generating the cash flows from that. Uh, fictitious revenues, right? Concealed liabilities and expenses. Yeah, all of these, and we saw that consistent, are examples of, uh, uh, could be a red flag of that, could be inability to generate cash flows from operations. Looking at the auditing standards, consideration of fraud and a financial statement auditor, the audit, the auditor should ask management about the risk of fraud and how they addressed it, which of the following is not described as an issue the auditor would ask management about suspected instances of fraud? Yeah. Management's understanding of fraud risk? Yeah. Whether and how management communicates the company's financial results to the employees? Not so much, right? Programs, what are the controls? Yeah, we would be interested in that that will prevent, detect, deter the fraud. Okay. All right, good. Uh, looking at uh, now some of the calculations here, and we have our accounts receivable, and we are saying that the accounts receivable uh, are 72,000, and the uh, net sales are uh, 1,200,000. Now, they're doing it here a little differently. The way you see the book doing this is a little different than how we were studying earlier, but I kind of like to do where I calculate the turnover and then I divide the turnover into the number of days, 365 days in a year to come up with that. So if I have net sales of 1,200,000 and then I divide that by 72,000, okay, and I do the math on that, 1,200,000, it's going to go ahead and you get to watch me use my calculator here. 1,200,000, right? You divide that by the 72,000. That gives you a turnover. They turn their receivables over 16.67 times. Okay, I'll carry that out two decimals. 16.67 times. Then what I like to do is I take that and I divide that into the number of days in a year, 365. 
And when you take the 365 and you divide that by 16.67, you get, and um, you know, you get something pretty close to this 21.9 uh, days. Okay. Okay. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, right? Uh, for most entities, I think collecting that quickly would be pretty good, right? Okay, good. Uh, refer to the following selected information, da da da. And they want us to go ahead and um, they want us to compute the day sales uncollectible. Again, the day sales uncollectible is the amount of days that things are sitting in uh, accounts receivable. Now, this problem, uh, they gave us the account receivable at the beginning and the end of the year. Um, I would think a better way to answer this would have been to take the average of the receivables, okay? And the way you do the average of the receivables, you take the two years, add them together, then divide that by two. It gives you the average, two numbers if you want the average. This particular uh, example of a problem decided that they didn't really care about your ones information. They ignored that. And they just went with the 123,000 which is, um, you know, the sales. And then they went ahead and divided that by just the uh, 98,760. Uh, and when they divided it by the 98,760, okay, so you take that 823 and you divide that <clears throat> 823,000, and you divide that by the um, 98,760. You get a turnover of about 8.33. Okay. And then you go ahead and you take that 365 and divide that by the 8.33. Then you get something uh, pretty close to what they had there, which is this 43.8, okay? Um, so let's just have an agreement, guys, that uh, when I test you on this, I won't make you do the average like we saw in the calculations where we took the beginning and ending balances, multiplied, uh, added them together, and then divided that by two. We'll just do it the way we studied here. We'll just do the one year, and you don't have to worry about taking that average between the two years. Uh, although I think probably more precisely, it'd be better to take the average. But when you're calculating these ratios, I mean, you know, you're not going to get a huge um variation i think the number if you had done it um the way they were showing this in the book it would have been 41 times um that they um i mean excuse me 8.88 .8 times and so the days receivable would have been 41 times so you get pretty close either way but let's just agree so that we're consistent we'll just do it with the one year uh worth of receivables as you saw here okay good let's come over and uh, take a look and we have this company and they want to know, uh, and here they're asking, compare a company sales year one was this, year two was that, using year one as the base year, the percentage change, even though they're not calling this horizontal analysis, that's what it is as we go year over year. So um, notice they took the difference between the two years here, okay? They divide it by what, the first year in the analysis, and then they get the percentage uh, and it would be 0.14. And then, you know, it's a little annoying. They're multiplying that by a hundred. So, you know, to call that 14%, I think we know that, I think we got this far in our study of accounting and auditing. We know in fraud detection, we know that, you know, uh, 0.14 is 14%, okay? Okay, good. And then we look at this next one. And this next one is saying, well, um, what is the uh, common size test? And they're telling us that we want to see uh, what cost of goods sold constitutes of net sales. Okay, so if my cost of goods sold is 174400 
And I go ahead and I divide that for year two now up by 358,200. And I come to the 174,400, divide that by 358,200, right? I get this 0.48. 0.48, what, six or something, which is where the 48.7 uh, is coming from, okay? And so I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm not going to test you on rounding, guys, get something that's not looking perfect. And when I look at that, I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to do year one analysis because I just did it for year uh, two. And the only choice here would, would indicate me that the second one is the correct answer. Okay, so hopefully that is helpful for you. Um, keep doing this, looking at the lectures, looking at the slides, seeing the practice midterm as we move forward. And uh, so we'll see you next time. Okay, guys, have a good rest. Have a good desk. Have fun studying, okay?